Let's get going. Hi, everyone. Appreciate you joining us today. We're going to let people get in here. I still see some more attendees getting in, but we're going to get started because it is right on time and we want to be respectful and make sure we get to as much of Carrie's presentation and conversation as we can. So everyone should be in here now. Okay, well, let's get started. We are going to record this, so we will have it available for you if you want to watch it again or send it to someone who you think would benefit from the conversation. All right, so my name is Lacey Nymeyer john and I am the Director of Alumni Career and Professional Development here at the University of Arizona. Thanks to all the alumni, students, friends who are joining us today for our Cats in the Corner office conversation with alumna Dr. Carrie Besnett Howard. Hauser, so sorry, uh, president and CEO of the Colorado Mountain College. If you are just joining us, Cats in the Corner Office is our online speaker series featuring highly accomplished University of Arizona alumni and distinguished faculty and staff members. This event is presented by the University of Arizona's Alumni Career Lab. And the Career Lab looks to help our alumni navigate and manage their careers and build their professional networks. For more career information, you can visit ArizonaAlumni.com backslash Career Lab. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Arizona or at Alumni Career Lab. Okay, today's conversation, like I said earlier, we are going to record it. It will be archived on our website to access on demand. And after our discussion, Dr. Hauser is going to take questions from the audience. So you can submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And before we jump into our program, I just wanna share some background highlights of Dr. Hauser. And they are very lengthy. She has accomplished so much in her career. We are really excited to have her here. But since 2013, Dr. Carrie Besnett Hauser has served as president and CEO of the Colorado Mountain College, a uniquely financed and dual mission public institution enrolling over 15,000 students annually at 11 campuses in the central Rocky Mountains. Prior to her role at Colorado Mountain College, uh, Carrie held leadership roles at the Kauffman Foundation and the Metropolitan State University of Denver and the Daniels Fund. While at Daniels, she was a loaned executive advising Denver's mayor on a citywide college scholarship program, as well as assisting the Metro Denver Sports Commission on an initiative to attract top tier sporting events, including the Olympic Games. She has co-chaired the 2012 Women's Final Four as well. Currently, Carrie chairs the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission and serves on the El Palmar Northwest Regional Council and the Vail Valley Foundation Board of Directors. On a national level, she is on the American Council on Education Board of Directors and is the past president of the National Scholarship Providers Association. And she serves on several boards as well as previous gubernatorial appointments gubernatorial appointments, sorry, such as the Colorado Women's Centennial Vote Commission, the Colorado's Blue Ribbon Commission on Healthcare Reform, and the Colorado Commission on Higher Education. She has been recognized as the leader of the year and one of the 50 for the future of Colorado. Hauser's background includes teaching assignments at UCLA, the University of Denver, and Colorado State University. She has held research and legislative staff roles, as well as positions at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education and the University of Arizona, her wonderful alma mater. And after completing her undergraduate degree at the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Hauser has earned her master's and PhD degrees from UCLA, and as well, as well as completed the advanced management program at the Wharton School of Business. Here's the fun stuff. <laughs> Dr. Hauser is an avid outdoors woman, and she has climbed to the Mount Everest base camp and summited Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Rainier, and 56 of Colorado's highest peaks, the 14ers. 
Uh, she has held the proud title of Swamper, which we might have to ask that later, <laughs> while working many summers for the Hatch River Expeditions in the Grand Canyon National Park near her beloved hometown of Flagstaff, Arizona. She and her husband enjoyed skiing, hiking, boating, biking, and exploring the Rocky Mountain West, as well as remote places around the world. So Dr. Hauser, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your expertise, and maybe expanding upon some of the success that you've achieved in your career. Happy to do it. Bear down. Yes, and go <laughs> cats. Go cats. So Dr. Hauser, I have some questions for you, and I would love to start those questions with you giving us a, a summary of all that you've done in your career. And along your journey, maybe touch on some key decisions or events that helped you get to where you are today. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, as many that know me know me well, um, I am an absolute diehard lead red and blue wildcat. <laughs> so sometimes somewhat obnoxiously. Um, so it's fun to be able to do this and to sort of be transported back to Arizona and to be with all of you. You know, I mean, I think um, I appreciate, Lacey, your your introductions. And I think, you know, to your question, I mean, I think we make decisions every day, right? You know, some of them are big and some of them are small and, and sometimes you don't know. And, you know, as I was thinking a little bit about this conversation today, you know, it's this crazy cosmic universe, right? That, that puts pieces together. And sometimes at the time, we don't know that they're actually leading to something. And so my kind of big first decision and my big first step was literally right out of the University of Arizona. And I won't mention how many long, how many years ago that was, but you can do the math yourself. Um, but I thought I was going to go sort of, you know, be a lawyer. I thought I was going to go to Washington, D.C. I thought I was going to be in this policy world. We can get back to that in a little bit because um, I had had a, had a internship in uh, on Capitol Hill and I just kind of caught that bug and you know it was a conversation I had I was a student I, I gave tours and I was a student ambassador when I was at Arizona and so I you know gave tours to new prospective students and um, and I got to know some of the folks in the admissions office fairly well and the Alumni Association as well I was pretty involved um, as a student still while I was in the Alumni Association in various different student government and clubs and organizations. And a job came up to represent the University of Arizona on the West Coast. And I was actually based in LA um, and my territory was sort of Seattle to, to San Diego. And I visited high schools, I put together events, um, you know, for when, you know, there was a basketball game at UCLA, you know, we would put together an alumni event or something like that before the game. and. Um, did a little development work, just kind of a little bit of all that. So sort of sort of the West Coast rep for the University of Arizona. So I came back quite a bit. I was in Tucson a lot. And it probably is the reason I'm in my job today, because I sort of didn't take that first sort of what I where I thought I was going to go. And because I was in Los Angeles, I was right in the backyard of UCLA. Um, I had really good mentors and support from the University of Arizona because I couldn't pursue graduate school in Tucson because that's not where I was physically. And so the University of Arizona, my, my bosses and, and my supervisors and, and people that had been really good mentors, um, we could probably name a few that lots of you know out there, um, they really supported me to finish my master's and then my PhD work at UCLA. And I don't know that I really had planned to go into higher ed at that point either. I still thought I was probably going to, you know, pursue a law school degree or something like that. And one thing leads to a next, to the next. And now I can actually legitimately say, you know, as a college president, I'm actually doing what I studied. And, you know, I had this kind of longer somewhat, you know, I had a lot of detours along the way, but I have found my way back to the thing that I love the most, and that is to level the playing field and give people opportunities. And um, I had such a good experience at the University of Arizona as an undergraduate that to think that everybody might have some form of that kind of experience, um, and it's not just obviously the kind of the textbook education that you get, but it's it's everything else. Um, and so that's really what my job is today. So that first decision to to take a job that I don't know that I thought I was going to sort of that's the track I was going to go into, but I really trusted the people that knew me well and knew what I was good at um, and and what that might lead to. Um, and here I am today, however many years later. I love that. And I love how you stress the um, impact of that one decision, right? And having that you know, 
faith or following intuition just to take that step forward and to you know really be courageous and and taking on those positions so and look at where they might lead us yeah and I never thought in a million years I'd live in Los Angeles California and I was there for almost seven years and loved it so don't know that I'd go back but um, some of my greatest U of A friends um, were also in LA having graduated from the U of A and we we were all very close friends and navigated the freeways and the beaches and did a lot of stuff together so it was really fun yeah not as many mountains over there no not Maybe as many above. but you can find them you can find them if you go north but <laughs> that's true that's right well let's talk a little bit more about kind of your role and Colorado Mountain College, it has a unique mission and a unique position within the community. So maybe tell us a little bit more about kind of your vision, your goals, and, and the importance of connecting education to the community for economic impact. Well, it's a little bit how CMC was designed, or actually it's almost entirely how CMC was designed in the first place. And like I said previously, I don't know that I ever thought that I would become a college president. I actually had my my dad was in higher education and um, you know pretty pretty high level in Arizona um, when I was there, and sort of here I am. Um, and I think it's really because Colorado Mountain College operates and has the mission that it does. I kind of became aware of it um, when I was in Denver and I was a governor's appointee to the Colorado Commission on Higher Education, and I and I was like oh. What is that institution up there in the mountains and how do they how do they operate and you know they're they're sort of unique in a lot of ways and and predominantly we're unique because we have 11 campuses in very high cost mountain resort towns um, and that's a hard business proposition to um, and very expensive to do that and so 60 years or so ago we're fairly young in the higher education landscape you know, a group of people bushwhacked around these beautiful, you know, you see my in my background, these beautiful mountain communities. This was before some of the big ski resorts. This is before interstates. This is before broadband or cell phones. And they essentially bushwhacked around and say the only way that we're going to have post-secondary opportunities for people that live in these, at the time, mostly rural ranching communities is, is, is if we started ourselves. So they put Colorado Mountain College on a ballot and essentially invited um, those residents who were living here at the time to vote to tax themselves. And long story short, 60 years ago, rough, roughly, they said yes by a measure of two to one. And it was a really large footprint to, to have the tax base and to have this sort of number of high school graduates and to have enough sort of population and scale. You had to knit together a bunch of these mountain, mountain counties. Now we're nine counties. We have 11 campuses. I mean, at the time, you have to think about people voting for to, to tax themselves essentially to pay for this in addition to the contr contributions that they make to the state of the Colorado and the higher education system in Colorado um, with sort of really big faith and vision that there would be the opportunity to serve these communities. So our job, we're technically, you know, sort of boring um, by statute. We're considered a local district college because we are actually a taxing district. Um, I have an elected board um, of trustees. They represent a taxing district, and they're all from all these different communities. Um, we're also considered a dual mission institution, which um, you mentioned earlier, which is somewhat unique. Um, CMC is a little unique, not just in Colorado, but nationally, in that we really offer what these mountain communities ask from us. So that means we offer a mix of programs. So we have bachelor's degrees. We also have associate degrees. We have very specialized certificates that are very specific to the economies that you'll sort of see behind me. We have, I think, the only avalanche science program in the entire country. Um, and we also kind of fuel, we train nurses, we train teachers, we train law enforcement professionals, first responders, ski patrollers, you know, ev everybody that's kind of kind of make these um, mountain communities operate and healthy. Um, and so that's what our students do. We also also sort of do a mix of applied science programs, sort of, you know, really skills based. And then we also do, you know, a whole host of liberal arts programs. Um, and we're also here for all these folks that have second, third and fourth homes, you know, in these communities that have the, you know, the luxury to do that. They want to come and take a ceramics class or a Zumba class or something like that. So we're a little bit of a one stop shop. Um, and I think um, it is absolutely our job to be completely in tune with these communities. We don't do what they don't need. Um, we're not, we don't do electrical engineering. We don't do marine biology. You know, we do a lot of environmental programs, which you can imagine just because of the, you know, the very fragile nature of these high altitude mountain communities. Um, so that's really what we do. And our students 
you know, uh, we were talking before we got on, we have campuses that are fully residential and are, you know, sort of more traditional um, with all this kind of student activities and clubs. And we also have campuses where most everybody lives locally and they, they come to campus or they travel to campus or they take classes online or they're out in the field, you know, learning mountain orientation or some form of a, you know, environmental science or whatever that case may be. Um, so it's a pretty unique place, I think. Um, and it's partly why I was so drawn to it. I have um, a lot of experience in private foundations. That's I spent as much of my career at a couple of big foundations. And CMC almost operates like a foundation in some ways because we bring in these resources from our communities that 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 pay for us, that help pay for us. And we push it back out. I mean, our job is to push it back out um, in, in training, obviously in training students, but we have facilities, um, you know, we contribute to, it's very, very difficult to afford housing uh, in these mountain communities right now, particularly post pandemic. There's just nothing left. They, everything got gobbled up. Uh, so we offer housing, um, obviously for our students, in some cases for our employees. Um, and really try to contribute just to the really healthy economic backbone of these communities. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I just find that so you know, refreshing and wonderful to see how well you've integrated into these communities and the relationships that you're building um, and accessibility that you're providing to these wonderful programs. Um, so you've been at the Colorado Mountain College for almost 10 years. What was a program or initiative that you, know, you find to be really proud of during your time? Well, I always answer this question first by saying I have the single best team. Bar none, I'm sorry to my colleagues in Tucson, but I just, I have this incredible team um, at CMC and it's taken a while. I mean, as, as you'll probably get to these questions later, but I just sort of have a coaching mentality and it's building a team of really incredible people and um, right people in the right seats on the bus, whatever sort of cliche you want to use if you want to draw from Jim Collins, who's a Coloradan. Um, I have a really great team and every single person, um, particularly at the leadership team and certainly our faculty and everyone that that works close to students um, as we are kicking off a new academic year, I'm just really proud, um, you know, with 11 campuses and sort of a central office with kind of a C-suite of of executives, um, it, it really means that you have to sort of click on that, that engine and that team really needs to work really well. And we need to communicate well with each other because we just have all these very distant, you know, have campuses that are two or three and a half hour drive, you know, kind of from our central office and to make sure that they feel very much part of the family and that they're operating well and that they're healthy and, and have what they need. I think is it's, it's just a real testament to um, a really great team. My board of trustees is visionary exceptional they're all leaders in their communities and they've been um you know really supportive of as well so i'm probably most proud of that just from a standpoint of it helps us get the job done um, and i think it speaks to sort of the leadership questions that you might ask a little bit later i think from a programmatic standpoint um, some of the things that i'm really really proud of um, you might not think of for those of you who come to ski and enjoy these mountain communities you might you might see them as fairly affluent, exclusive, and probably fairly homogenous, and that's that's not entirely incorrect. Um, there also is a really um, large population of Latino um, uh, individuals, um, and certainly students that that come to this to CMC. And when I arrived, almost um, I'm just about to hit um, finish up nine years. Uh, the college had 13% Latino uh, enrollment, and it, we just didn't quite reflect um, the communities that we serve. Some of them much more predominantly Hispanic and some of them not, but in the aggregate, we had a long way to go. And so we really said, we're gonna put a lot of effort towards this. So we were actually recognized, um, it's, we're approaching two years as a Hispanic serving institution, um, and we're approaching 30% of our has, uh, Latino enrollment. And we're not like Tucson, we're not on a, we're not a border, community. I mean, there's a lot of HSIs out there that by virtue of sort of where they are geographically, that makes a lot of sense. We had to very much be very intentional about bringing sort of those numbers up and make sure that not only did our population of students reflect um, the communities and who we serve, that our students are actually performing as well as all other students at the college. And that's probably the other thing that I'm most proud of is that we've erased um, most of our equity gaps um, for first generation Latino students mostly um, that are, you know, part of sort of the economic backbone of these communities. Many of them come from families and households that are monolingual. Um, we had to think a lot about how we translate and how we reach 
uh, students we've we've reached very far down um, into our high school partners that are, that are sort of local high school K-12 um, school districts to say, how do we get more kids ready um, for whom, you know, kind of higher education might might not have always been in their thinking. Uh, and I think we've made some really good progress there. So those are things that I'm really proud of. We stood up um, a program that's gotten some uh, attention nationally called Fund Sueños, which translates to the Dream Fund. Uh, and that was a program that was um, sort of orchestrated through the CMC Foundation and a couple of really generous donors helped us stand that up and pilot it. And it was to support um, our DACA students or those that weren't eligible for federal financial aid and to close that gap. Um, and that got some national notice as well. So um, we can be a, a, you know, a small, you know, mountain sort of resort college that, that can incubate things you know the nice thing about having 11 campuses is we can try some things and test some things and pilot some things and if they work they may just work for that campus but they if they work kind of in the aggregate for the entire college we can sort of raise them up and 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 actually sort of deploy them and 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 hopefully give the model away too if there's other institutions that are interested and we've had other interest uh, institutions interested in that particular model as well so those are a few things that I'm really proud of it's it's really about how do we Make sure that, as I said at the beginning, those that might not think college is for them, we open the door, we figure out how to raise people up, we figure out how to get them ready, we bring them in the door, we welcome them, um, we provide an environment that will help them be successful, um, and hopefully we see sort of the complexion of leadership, you know, we're growing our own, right, um, and, and hopefully at, over time, um, we're going to see much more of a diverse um, set of leaders in senior positions and starting businesses and being really part of sort of the economic um, sort of fabric of these communities. Yeah, I love that, you know, word of, you know, the complexion of leadership and, and how that's reflected in your community and building leaders, not only within your organization, but also, you know, in the communities in their own spaces um, across the many campuses that you have. So thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I just want to, you know, quickly change gears just a little bit. And we've heard a lot about the great resignation or great restructuring, however you want to describe it happening post pandemic. Um, but we're seeing people making shifts in their careers to find you know, more alignment with work and passions. Um, maybe reflect on that a little bit. You know, what are you seeing as within your college and again, the needs of your communities, then also personally? How does your work really reflect and align with your passion and values? Yeah, I mean, I think you sort of answer it with the question, right? Um, you know, you'd like to think that you don't have to go to work. Like you want to be part of something and you want to contribute to something that you, you, you happen to get paid, right? <laughs> you happen to be able to make a living. But I think, you know, part of the journey and sort of my encouragement to, you know, to any particularly, you know, students or those that are, you know, closer to graduating or, you know, maybe you're, you know, recently out of, of college and sort of thinking about kind of what's your next your career path is to just really ask yourself, uh, you know, with sort of the great resignation, I think people said, I'm going to do what I want to do and not what I have to do. And I think it can be one and the same. Um whether I'm a good example of that or not, I, I just, I never did anything that I didn't want to do as well. And sometimes that takes some risk to say, I'm not going to, I'm going to walk away from something and I'm going to pivot and I'm going to try to find something that really feeds my soul and also feeds, you know, my family. Um, and that's, you know, a journey that I think takes a while. Sometimes you might not get there right away. You know, uh, sometimes it takes additional training or graduate school. And, and, and those are certainly pieces to the big puzzle. Um, and the other, the other thing I would say is, you know, there's lots of opportunities um, to sort of extracurricularly fill your passions. You know, you can, you can do a job that you're really good at. You know, you might be an accountant or you might be, you know, something that kind of takes you into a, you know, a desk job from eight to five or whatever that might be more kind of a traditional setting. As long as you find a way, you know, coach your kids little league team, you know, serve on a board, you know, be part of the community somehow, you know, run for city council, whatever that is, because I find that even though they might seem separate, I think they feed each other and, and those activities make us a, a more well-rounded person. They, you know, it's sometimes, you know, I was saying to, to, to you before we started that, you know, so much of the education that you, that I got at the University of Arizona was outside of the classroom. I mean, certainly had awesome faculty, don't get me wrong, I can name a whole bunch of them still. 
And, you know, I draw upon that, but I think it's as much, you know, for a big place like the U of A, I mean, it was navigating, you know, a campus of 30 or 35,000 students. I mean, that's a small city, you know, and just getting around and you have new students coming on campus and, you know, just learning to be, you know, self-reliant and, and, and being able to make a mistake here or there, or find your way. So, you know, I think the other sort of maybe lesson in what we've all been through the last number of years is um, you can pivot. It doesn't, there's no point at which in your career, you can't sort of say, I'm going to kind of go in this direction. That may be a really hard turn and it may be a softer turn into something that still, you know, you may have been really highly, you know, if you're an engineer or something like that, you were really highly trained in a career track and you might go, well, that doesn't sort of feed my soul. But I think there's other ways to do that. And, you know, our, our communities and companies and, you know, sort of economic you know, kind of industry clusters need talent. I think we know we know that more than ever right now. I mean, we're all starving for the best talent. Um, and you can find a way to extend your talents and also feel fulfilled. Uh, I think it makes you a happier person. I think it makes you a better supervisor. It makes you a better employee. It makes you just all around want to get up on a Monday morning <laughs> and go do whatever you're going to do rather than kind of go, oh, God, you know, week starts again. So. No, I, I love that you mentioned that and, you know, feeding your yourself as well as feeding your family and, and um, from a perspective of work. And I, that relates so much to, you know, my core value as well as what I learned at the University of Arizona being on the swim team. Our coach always talked about the more we develop as people, the better you're going to perform in every area of your life. And but you are the constant, whether you're going to class going to your competition, mm -hmm. going to the grocery store, you're the constant. And so you have to be whole first before you can, you know, perform at your best in these other areas. So I love that. Right. You that. Absolutely. Yep. So you mentioned also, you know, the mentors and you've said it a couple of times now, the people in your life that have helped you get, you know, to where you are in your journey and maybe continue to, to help you progress where you are and where you want to be. Maybe touch on, you know, how did you find those people? Who are those individuals? And um, what advice would you have for those who are also seeking advice, support, mentorship? Yeah, I think I think sometimes we don't realize that we have mentors. Um, and as, as I was thinking a little bit about this question, yeah, there's some folks that would say, hey, would you be my mentor? <laughs> or, hey, would you, you know, can I shadow you or whatever? So it might be more of a formal relationship. As I was thinking back on this, though, I think most of the ones I had just were, they were incredible role models. And they, you know, I think mentorship is relationships. That's really what it is. And, and I think about every single step in my career as I was reflecting on this, I haven't done this in a while, but as I was sort of reflecting on this conversation today, every single key inflection point in my career was influenced by a relationship. And whether or not I would have described that as a mentorship, I think most of them probably were, right? Because it was somebody that said, hey, apply for this position. Hey, I think you'd be really good for this. Hey, you know, I want to introduce you to someone. Hey, would you, have you considered this? Whatever. They kind of know you well enough to say maybe more about you than you would even yourself. And so I think that's a lot what men mentorships is. And it's, it's kind of that old adage is that you, you know, sort of you behave the same way when people aren't watching, you know, you're, you're providing this, you know, model and you're being really consistent and, and people know what to expect from you. So the people that I think of, and I kind of go back in my mind and think of, of most of my quote mentors, certainly coaches as an athlete, I think, and you would know this, Lazy. I mean, you just, that those coaches couldn't have been more important to my career because they, you know, they, they framed what it is to be a team. And they framed what it is to work really hard and they framed what it is to suffer because <laughs> it isn't always going to feel really good, right? You're going to have to actually suffer and you're going to have to, you know, figure out how to be better than you were last time. You know, if you're a member of a team or you're swimming or, you know, whatever that is, whether it's a time trial or you're on a relay team or you're a member of a basketball team or whatever that is. So I have a lot of coaches that I can really, you know, sort of point back to. Um, and then it really was sort of along the way, finding those good fits and knowing that someone had your back and they, they wanted you to be really good in whatever you were doing. And they also recognized that you were probably going to move on at some point. And so, so to the extent that they could invest in you and know that you were going to eventually probably leave and move into a new role, 
um, that's part of it, right? We are all passing through in some way. And we're not always going to keep everyone and, and you're not going to, you're, you know, as much as I'm sure the University of Arizona would always like to have you in this job, you're probably someday going to do something else or you're going to do something else at the U. So, um, so those are things as well. I, as I was reflecting back, I think most, I would say, of the people that really invested in me were men. Um, and I have tried really hard to, and, and a lot of that was because those were the people in the positions at the time when I was kind of going through the tra trajectory of my career. It doesn't mean that there weren't women that were important to me. They just happened to be my bosses. They happened to be my supervisors. They happened to be the people that said, hey, I think, you know, I'd, I'd really like to, to support you in this. And and I would also not under understate that people, in my case, men, white men, and I think every almost every case, I think people in majority positions have to invest in people that aren't in those majority positions in order for that complexion and that combination to change. So here we are two women leaders on this call. If this had been 20 or 25 years ago, it might not have been the case or however long ago. So I think the other thing about this is to always recognize that if we can mentor others that don't look like us, that that may be of a different gender, may be you know, underrepresented in various different leadership fields, you might they might not know it at the time that you've done that on their behalf and i now reflect back on how important that was as somebody that spent most of my research career on gender equity um you know that was my doctoral work um those are things that i realize now that i wouldn't probably have had the opportunities that i do if it had not been for those mentors that realized that 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 those proportions and and who sat in certain seats needed to change. I'm the second woman president at my institution, uh, and so and I hope I'm I hope there's many more that come behind me, and that those ratios eventually sort of completely equalize. Um, same thing for you know people of color and others that um, we still don't see in in enough roles. And so um, again, to the extent that I can mentor and others mentored me to change that landscape, um, I'm very very grateful and thank them very much. Yeah, and I love how you mentioned, you know, getting to know people and their potential and, you know, encouraging them to take their roles, because like you said, sometimes you just don't even know what you don't know, right? And, and you do have other perspective to kind of give you the push. <laughs> that yeah. You need. yeah. And to watch out for you. I mean, I, I mean, my best example is my current job. Um, you know, I always said, no way, I'm never going to be a college president. Those are awful, nasty <laughs> horrible, hard jobs, you know, people stay in them for four years. And if that, you know, and, you know, I worked for a president um, uh, in Denver. It was my last higher education gig before this one. And he kept saying to me, and he he had spent some time in Arizona, Steve Jordan, I'll, I'll name him by name. He had been at the Arizona Board of Regents. He's somebody I kind of knew a little bit when, I, you know, we were both in Denver. Again, a good example of somebody that had his eye out um, and sort of asked me if I would join his team at one point. And at one point when he said, Carrie, you know, you need to go be a college president. You have a, you have a PhD in higher education. You love this work. I'm like, no, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. I said, but you know what? I make one exception. You know, that Colorado Mountain College up there in the mountains, you know, my, my husband and I love to spend time in the mountains. We're both mountain climbers. We love river rafting, all this. And I thought, wow, you could live and do, you can live where you want to live and do what you want to do. And the job came up and he remembered. And he's the one that said, hey, can I nominate you for that? And the rest is history <laughs> nine years later. So it's those things also, I, I think that mentors do. And they, you, you can put a little sort of message out to the universe and they remember. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> what, what a special relationship and you know, obviously meant to be because look at what you have done in your role here. Um, yep. So I want to shift focus just a little bit again and make me pivot towards specifically your leadership. And maybe we can focus the, the, the remaining questions on leadership and, and how we can develop leadership. So to get us started on this topic, how would you define your leadership style? And how did you come to this type of approach to leadership? Well, I touched on it a little bit earlier, and, and that is just having been an athlete. You know, I, I just think there is something to it and a, a mentality that, you, you, you know, you probably really appreciate, you know, it's a lot of nights in the gym, it's early, you know, early mornings, it's, you know, it's sort of all that that kind of it goes into working really hard and staying physically fit and mentally aware and sort of all those things that, you know, that 
that are part of sort of being a member of a team and being a coach. And, you know, I often sort of use kind of this athletic sort of analogy for even a, a college or university, right? You have kind of your ownership group, which might be the board of regents in, in the case of Arizona. You have kind of your coach, your, you know, your coaches, you know, which are kind of the presidents. Um, in, in my case, I would sort of describe myself as a coach. You have kind of your quarterback, you know, might be your chief operating officer or your provost or whatever that is. And then you have all these incredible members of your team. And so for me, it's always about team. Um, it's it's building your team. It's 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 making sure that um, you know you're even if you have a point guard, they they could sub for a forward if they needed to, or you know that you're cross training some of your team as well, and, and you're recognizing they might get traded at some point or whatever. And to the extent that you want to ha- build your team, you're really investing in that team, and and everybody has an. Inc- equally important role um, in whatever that organization or that team is. So I, I very much bring a coaching sort of mentality to this. And we all have something to learn, right? I still have coaches. I have people that I look at that try, try you know, improve what I do. I have a group of presidents around the country that I lean on, um, you know, to say, hey, you know, I'm, oh God, I had a really tough you know, situation happen? And have you been through this? And can you support me through this? So, you know, I think it also a coaching mentality also comes with you're also improving yourself. You, you're you're never going to be perfect either, and you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> we all make mistakes, and we're on the injured reserve once in a while. We need to sort of step out and step back in, and so that's kind of that's kind of how I view leadership. Yeah, and you, know, I I love that analogy. I can absolutely relate to it, and and see how it applies not just to you know the world of sports, but it but into a variety of industries. So I appreciate that. And I think we can all visualize how that works. One of the things that really stood out to me and you you mentioned is one of your key points of leadership as um, this genuine and unwavering commitment to a cause greater than yourself, right? You talk about team, you talk about this uh, bigger goal than just your own point and stat record. Uh, so tell us how this shows up for you and your experience in being an industry leader as well as a community leader. Well, I'll off, I often sort of use Sir Edmund Hillary as an example in this case, uh, if you know who that was. Um, Edmund Hillary and his partner, Tenzing Norgay, were the first to summit Mount Everest. And they still to this day have never said who actually summited first because they were together. Which I really love, and they're both no longer around, so nobody will ever know. Um, I I have a dream that they sort of stepped on the on the summit of Everest at the same time. But Ed Hillary, you know, I was in Nepal a number of years ago, and um, we, as you mentioned, we climbed to the Everest Base Camp. But it was more the journey to get to the base camp that was so important, and that was to sort of trace the journey of Edmund Hillary, and he understood as a tall, lanky Kiwi that he had an incredible opportunity. He became very famous overnight. And he also saw um, sort of what it was like to, you know, be in Nepal uh, and and a very, very poor country. And, you know, as sort of climbing kind of started, you know, kind of catching on and, and, and just sort of that whole environment. And so it was more important to me to trace everything else he did in Nepal. And that was to build schools and hospitals um, and to try to leverage his kind of fame into something that would really give back. And he used to say, invest in children who are not your own. And that's a quote of his, I believe. Um, maybe it was borrowed from someone else, but that's what he said. And and I think if we we take that perspective and invest in, you know, whatever cause it is that's bigger than ourselves, certainly we're fulfilled, but we're not going to be around forever. <laughs> how can we actually make this world better for everyone else and, and care? This is, you know, I think about when school bonds are on ballots and I don't have kids in school, but if you invest in it, your community is going to be better. You know, your, your entire, you know, the sort of cultural capital of your region is going to be better. You're going to have, you know, you're going to have better schools and museums and all the things that I think, you know, make for a really rich cultural and, you know, experience people that care about their, you know, their neighborhoods, whatever it might be. So that adage of, you know, care about children who are not your own was his, but I, you know, I try to sort of live by that. Um, You know, I worked for a big foundation in, in the Denver area that serves a number of Rocky Mountain states called the Daniels Fund. You know, Bill Daniels, who's sort of considered the founder of cable television, you know, he was also a guy, didn't have children that of his own. 
um, died in 2000 and left a billion and a half dollars to what was then overnight the largest foundation in the Rocky Mountain region. And I just had an incredible opportunity to join the team really early on um, when we were getting that up and running. And he was another guy that left all of his money to support and help kids who were not his own. And he recognized what that investment would do and the ripple effect and, and what it would mean. And hopefully it buds future philanthropists, right? It, it, somebody says to me, right, you're at the Alumni Association, you're, at the, you know, you're in the building that houses the foundation at the, at, at the University of Arizona. We invest in somebody, something else. You know, we sponsor a scholarship, we mentor somebody, you know, we're part of someone else's life because we know that it's going to make them better. It's also going to make us better. And, and it's just going to have this ripple effect um, that I don't know that can ever be measured. So that's kind of how I approach things and try to choose how I spend my time. Um, is it, will it make a, will it make a difference for someone else? Yeah. And I love how you mentioned, you know, as we give back and we serve others, we also grow personally and professionally as well. And, and yep. it's kind of this full circle, you know, positive um, uh, results driven win-win for everyone. Yeah. yeah, it is. I love that. Um, and, and another thing that you've mentioned, and I can see this in your answers, and as we kind of get to know you a little bit more, Dr. Hauser, um, you also talk, talk about authentic leadership and how we need that in, you know, a variety of different leadership positions from you know government to national government to local government to education even in the business sector so what does this mean for leaders today why is this so critical and, and why do you care so much about this i could not probably think of a more important thing right now um and i just say that because of the environment that we're in sort of in this kind of politically charged you're right i'm wrong um, it, it's just become so caustic and, and so challenging. And, and I think it also speaks back to the role of higher education, regardless of what institution it is, you know, it's the ability to find ways to have a conversation and not necessarily agree, but agree to disagree agreeably, you know, whatever the quote that you want to use. Um, it's, it's just the incredible function of post-secondary education and an opportunity to, to dialogue and bring a whole lot of folks um, together in one place. Um, and the reason to me that sort of authenticity and sort of authentic leadership is so important is that I want to be able to count on something. You know, I want it to be consistent. I, you know, I think authentic leadership comes with, you know, what to expect from someone. It doesn't mean that they're going to be a robot, but I know how Carrie is going to react in a certain situation. You know, if I, if I'm, you know, if, if somebody, a member of my team makes a mistake or something like that, you know, gosh, we're going to learn from that. You know, it shouldn't happen twice or three times, certainly, but, but we're going to learn from that. And, and they know what to expect from you. They, 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 they're not going, oh, you know, how, how's she going to react or, or what's that going to look like? That it's, it, you, you're consistent, you show up the same way, you're consistent in how you sort of apply either leadership or expectations or praise or whatever that is. Um, and I think the most important thing is you do what you say will do. You are somebody that people can count on. And I think that's another piece right now that is just missing is if you say you're going to do something, you do it. You know, you, you, you know, so ask somebody asks for a letter of recommendation, you deliver it. You know, if, if somebody needs something from you or, you know, it could be more, you know, theoretical than that, you know, but it's, that's the other piece of it as well is that you can be someone that people can count on. And that's whether you're following or leading or somewhere in the sidelines or whatever is, you, you know, you show up. Um, there's reciprocity. You know, I think that's another really important thing about, you know, leadership is if somebody, you know, makes a gesture to you, you follow up, you know, it's, it's not sort of this one-sided relationship. It needs to be this constantly organic. If you're giving, I'm giving, if you're going to take a risk, I'm going to let you take a risk and I might take a risk back. Um, a lot of leadership and a lot of growing organizations, um, you know, there needs to be a spirit of risk-taking and, and, and there shouldn't be punishment for that, or there shouldn't be, you know, um, you, you shouldn't be left behind or sidelined or anything. If you took a risk, it should be actually, we we learn the most from our mistakes, right? <laughs> we will learn the most from our mistakes and, and we know what to do next time. And I mean, there, and, and the disappointments we have in life, um, those are the ones that we learn most from. And I think we pivot the most from them and we look back and go, had it not been for that occasion, um, you know, my story about the University of Arizona is I, I 
ran for student body president when I was there. I was I was on student government. I would have been the first female to hold that job. Um, again, that was a number of years ago. Um, won the primary, um, lost the general, um, had a not super favorable article in the Arizona Wildcat that was um, pretty, um, uh, it, it was sort of laden with gender, you know, undertones and that I would be too cheerleader like and there was a whole bunch of stuff in there that was just, I mean, it, now you would just go, oh my gosh, and at the time, it, you know, I had gender studies faculty, you know, reach out to me and say, wow, that was something. Um, and, you know, you learn from it as well. And the person that was uh, in the final sort of two with me is still a very good friend of mine, um, Dean Fink, he's a judge in Phoenix. And, you know, I think had that happened for me, I probably wouldn't be where I am today because I went off and did some other things. I went and did a, a you know internship on Capitol Hill in DC, um, you know, came back and worked for uh, the Congressman Jim Colby at the time in Tucson. And I, I found a whole bunch of other passions. And so it's one of those things that you learn most from your disappointments. You hold your head up. Um, that authentic leadership piece is also just getting back up you know, and sort of pulling your bootstraps up and showing up again the way that you've always shown up. And it doesn't mean that you can't be disappointed. And it doesn't mean you can't tell people you were disappointed or hurt or sad or, you know, um, frustrated or whatever the case may be. That's all part of life. Um, and you've got to sort of step forward again and move into a new direction. And, you know, I would say to any, you know, students that are listening, those knocks will happen. <laughs> They will. And, you know, in some way, to the extent you can embrace those disappointments and embrace the things that don't go the way that you think they will, because somewhere, some way in this cosmic universe, it will come back and actually serve you really well. Yeah. And, you know, that leads, you know, directly into the next question that I want to ask you, Dr. Hauser, is, you know, when you talk about authentic leadership, you know, you're going to embrace the setbacks as well as the successes. And so, you know, Talk to us about fortitude and building resiliency and coming back from setbacks. What are strategies that you use as an authentic leader yourself um, when those events happen? You know, for me, and we talked about this a little bit before everybody got on, for me, it's, I climb mountains and I, you know, I, I'm, the, my favorite place on the planet is the Grand Canyon. I grew up near there and spent a lot of time um, on the river down there and, so I think for me, it's putting yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, that's really that fortitude piece. And that can come in lots of different, you know, forms, right? Um, I'm just sort of using the avocational side of it. But this mountain behind me is Mount Sopris. It's about 13,000 feet. Um, climbed that a couple of years ago, actually, with a guy that's blind. Um, and so you think about fortitude from that standpoint. Um, my husband and I help guide him up. Um, he's he's pretty famous in and of himself um, for being a blind adventurer, Eric Weinmayer, uh, for anybody that's interested. He's um, he's an author and wrote a book called No Barriers, and I certainly encourage you to read it um, because it is all about fortitude. Uh, it's about a guy that's, you know, he's the only blind man to climb Mount Everest and kayak the Grand Canyon blind and a whole bunch of other things. Anyway, we got an opportunity to, to climb Mount Sopris with him a couple of, a couple of summers ago. And I find any time, and I have friends that I've climbed with, that you're not always going to reach the summit. Weather's going to come in, you're going to get hurt, you know, whatever, you're going to hit altitude, you know, poison ivy, you know, just pick, the, you know, pick the detour. Um, and so I use mountain climbing a lot as a, as an analogy for this. And it happens in life. It happens in leadership. Um, same thing is going to happen. You're going to, you're going to hit a curveball. you you know, something's going to happen. You know, it could, it could be personal. You know, you might have a relationship um, fall apart and you think that's the end of the world. And, you know, it, and it's not, um, it won't be, um, eventually you'll pick yourself back up. But that fortitude is to know that that summit will still be there on another day. And you may have to try it again. And you may have to go all the way back down and start again up to that summit, um, even though you're going to lose vertical feed and even, even though you're going to have to bushwhack and get yourself back in shape or whatever the case may be, use all those analogies. Um, and I think on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's, you know, part of, you know, being part of a family or a relationship uh, or being in an organization or being on a team, um, that's what it takes. You know, you, you, you're, it, everything is not going to go perfectly um, ever. And you won't even know what perfect is probably ever. 
um, and we're going to hit those day-to-day -day disappointments and we're going to hit the really big ones that you think I'm never going to get past this. Um, you know, I call them a crucible moment. You know, crucible is a sort of metamorphic term um, to draw on my uh, Dr. Cresson, who was my geology faculty member at U of A, but those crucible moments, he was one of my favorite faculty members, by the way, <laughs> he's still around. <laughs> um, you know, it's crucible. It means that it means metamorphic. It means you have been sort of hit by something that you will, you will come out of it completely in a different form. And you probably didn't know it at the time, but it's probably one of those things that will make you, make you better. And you probably won't, wouldn't have ended up where you are now if it hadn't been for those really crucible moments in your life. So they suck sometimes when they happen. And if to the extent you can embrace them, learn from them, grow from them, understand um, that there are incredible opportunities, you know, in the next chapter of your life. Um, those are things that I think really define fortitude. Yeah. And, you know, the phrase that keeps coming to my mind as you're talking and, and those analogies of the mountain, I love it, right? It, it's the opportunity in the obstacle, mm -hmm. right? And finding those in, there's a a specific mindset that, you know, we talk about all the time in athletics, right? And we've also heard, you know, Carol Dweck's growth mindset. But, you know, as you have summited some of the highest peaks in, in the country and, and in the world, right, you've literally um, taken the path less traveled. You've been around people who are also doing that. Um, and in athletics, we know that there are people who are good and there are people who are great. So what would you define as that X factor? For those people who take on those challenges, then they embrace them and they come out better on the other side. You know, what are some common there, commonalities between those people and qualities that we can look to develop in ourselves to be those type of people? Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. You know, um, I think, again, as I was mentioning before, we're just in this environment right now that I think we are in our own echo chambers. And I don't know that that makes for a really constructive dialogue. I don't know that that moves us forward as a country or communities or whatever, whatever the sort of, you know, grouping is. And, and I don't know that I would have known it at the time either. But these are things that you look back upon and go, yeah, that was probably really one of those crucible moments. I mean, I was a, an exchange student in Japan when I was in high school me. I'm a tall, blonde, blue-eyed sort of freak of nature, you know, um, at least at the time in Japan. And, you know, there were a lot of people that I met when I was there who had never met anybody that wasn't Japanese, much less, you know, me. Um, and, you know, v visiting some small villages and all that. And it, you know, it was very challenging. And I was very homesick at that point. And, and I also look back and think it was partly what made me passionate about equity, I was the one that was totally different. I didn't speak the language. I looked completely different. People stared at me. It was uncomfortable at times. And then also there were people that were very friendly and opening and accepting, and you knew the difference, right? And so I think to the extent that you can put yourself in situations and have conversations that, with people that don't think like you, that don't look like you, that, that but they put their pants on the same way, they brush their teeth in the morning, you know, all those things, they're the same fundamentally, and they also think differently. My husband and I just got back from visiting our 10th country in Africa. Um, we're always drawn back to the African continent. And, and for some of these reasons, you know, I think, um, you know, it puts us in a place where we're by far the minority. You know, we're, we, you know, it's, it's almost flip, ex exact flip of sort of the day-to-day -day experience that I have. And, and, I come back even more appreciative um, of, of how do we level the playing field and how does everybody feel, you know, comfortable in their own skin and who they are and what they bring to the table. And there's no reason that we can't grow this pie. I think too often we get into these zero sum mind games mindsets that if I win, you lose, or, you know, if more people are coming into something, then that means others have to get squeezed out. And I just, I just don't believe that uh, in any way, shape or form. There's, there's room for everyone. And certainly in this current economic environment where we can't hire enough people and there's just not enough talent, um, everybody's got to be at the table. We've got to make sure everybody has an opportunity. So I think that kind of X factor is put yourself in 
uncomfortable positions. Know what it feels like to be in those uncomfortable situations so that you can be a leader for others that um, might be, might feel that way every day of their life. I love that. And something that we can do regardless of what position you're in, what industry you're in, you know, seeking challenge and seeking those uncomfortable growth opportunities is, you know, I think very applicable to all of us. So thank you, Dr. Houses, for sharing that. Of course. You need to call me Carrie. (laughs) Uh, So I know we have just a couple minutes left and we have some questions that have come through the chat here. Um, Carrie, this has just been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. And I want to get to some of these questions. So we have two that come in. They're a little long, so I'm going to try to okay. say the best I can. So uh, one person is talking about mentorship and how you mentioned, mentioned finding mentors. And looks like this person, while they're under the direct supervision of their you know, want-to-be mentor, um, they're having a hard time separating work as a team to being a mentor-mentee relationship. Mm-hmm. So you talked about maybe finding those mentors who were supervisors. Um, so what would you recommend to this person to help them create a mentorship-focused relationship and help them to move on within their career? Well, first thing you need to do is ask. I mean, uh, you know, I think sometimes we we might make assumptions that people want to be mentors. You know, in my case, I I... I'm sometimes told, wow, you were a great mentor. I had no idea that I was mentoring someone. I just happened to be, we just happened to work together in some way. And they sort of saw that. I have a lot of those people that I go, wow, that is an amazing mentor to me. And they don't even really know. It's not a formal kind of title or relationship. So if it's something that you really want from someone, particularly if you're working directly with them, I think I think you need to ask. I and mean, I think you need to say, you know, I really, I really think a lot of you and I'd like you to mentor me. Here are things that I think you're really skilled at that, that could fill out my, you know, my toolkit. Um, and if that's not something that they want to do in an explicit way, then and it might mean that you need to find that in, a, in another, you know, format or, or case. And, and you can seek that out. Like I said earlier, it doesn't need to be in your current environment. I mean, you may have a pastor, you know, you may, you may have somebody, you know, a neighbor, you may have somebody in your HOA, if you're in an HOA, I mean, just, you know, think about all those things. And you just, you see somebody and go, wow, you know, they approach life differently. They approach things that in ways I think I can learn. And so I do think that one of the things that, that it's really important is just to ask and, and, and to define what that relationship is. If it's more of that formal, if that, if that really is what it is, you know, can, can we have coffee, you know, once a quarter, you know, can we sort of check in? Here are some things I'm working on, whatever. If it's more of a passive kind of thing, then that happens every day as organically as possible. And I think it's important just to be really observant um, and to watch things that you think are really good, make notes of them. You know, I'm, I'm a big, you know, sort of journaler, you know, take notes of things. I love quotes, you know, if you've noticed that today, because um, I have a hard time remembering all those. And so take some notes of those things and go back to them, you know, let it sit for six months and go back and go, wow, you know, I, I noted that down and I've been trying to practice that and, and I'm seeing that I'm making some progress or whatever. So. Yeah. And I love how you mentioned that you're taking ownership of that mentorship experience, come with questions, come with, you know, things that you want you know, guidance on from that mentor. I think that's, that's fantastic and great advice. One final question here okay. as, as we close out, uh, and I think this is very, this is perfect to end on, right? And, and looking at all of your service opportunities, Carrie, and not only in the sphere of education, but also, you know, within your community, within, um, you know, the Wildlife Commission and, you know, Northwest Regional Council for El Pomar, Uh, what's your career trajectory? Where are you going next? Where are your sights set? Well, my sights are at the moment set on doing the very best job I can in in my current role. And I think that's always really important. Um, uh, You know, I've been in this role longer than I have been any other. um, And, uh, you know, there's something to be said for that. I I really care about um, the work that we're doing. And I think the other thing that I've really learned, um, you know, I've mostly lived, other than growing up in Flagstaff, I've mostly lived in fairly large populated areas. And, um, but I remember what it was like to sort of grow up in Flagstaff, smaller town, rural, you know, kind of setting sort of similar to what I have in the background here. And I think the thing that I'm most committed to right now is 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 representing sort of rural America and and being in a place having been in very you know metropolitan areas Los Angeles Tucson Phoenix you know Denver for a very long time 
you know, living in these more remote rural places sometimes can get forgotten. Um, and a lot of decisions don't happen here, right? They happen in the capital. They happen in the more metropolitan urban populated areas. And so one of the reasons that I'm so committed to the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission is, you know, that that represents the entire state. Um, I'm obviously very committed to the outdoors and protecting our public lands. And so that's essentially kind of what we do and sort of regulate hunting and fishing and all that um, in the state. And so it's another way to be of service. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, you have your day job. And I think the things that round you out, I mean, it's, it's even a form of mentorship in some ways, serving in a capacity that isn't your day to day, but might be something that you're really interested in. So people that know me really well know that probably my most favorite thing is to be outside and to be, you know, to be in this incredible place called Mother Earth. And so I get to do the vocation. I get to do the things that I love to do on a day to day basis as a job and as a career. Um, and then I've to be able to complement it in some way with with volunteering and being on boards and, and being of service to the state um, has been really, really fulfilling. So where that takes me someday, I don't know. Um, I'm a big believer in it will reveal itself. Um, and I think sometimes you got to sort of do everything right and get lucky. And that will appear at some point. And, and I, I circle it back all the way to the beginning of the, this conversation. And it is just about relationships. It's never burn a bridge. You have something to learn from everyone. Um, those relationships are key. And I, there's not one step in my career that hasn't been influenced by a relationship that I've had um, and somebody that saw something in me that probably more so than I did myself. What a wonderful way to end this conversation. And Carrie, thank you so much for sharing those insights, the quotes, the messages, the analogies, I think are just so applicable to us in our day-to-day, -day, whatever our career is, I think we can all apply something that you've said today. So thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. School is starting soon. <laughs> uh, you're coming off from a, a wonderful trip to Africa, but squeezing this in and providing this opportunity for your Wildcat community is, is really special. We appreciate you. Thanks for the invitation. Bear down and go Wildcats. That's right. Go Cats. <laughs> All right. Everyone. Thanks, Lacey. Yes. Thank you. And don't forget, join the Bear Down Network. We want to stay connected to everyone. We appreciate you all joining us today. Take care. Bear down and go Cats. Go Cats. Bye. <laughs>